Well, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming to this uh, uh, event here at the lecture series here in the sunroom at Iowa State University. I'm very pleased to be here. He didn't mention that when I taught it, um, at uh, Yale University, I had a TA there um, who some of you may know. Uh, Dr. Peter Orism was a graduate student at Yale, and, and I was his TA for one semester. So some of you know, uh, some of you know Dr. Orism from the economics department. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here at Iowa State. I want to um, start off by just saying a couple words about the Ruth Institute and mentioning that we're going to be doing a raffle tonight of, uh, of Ruth Institute stuff. So we'll be, uh, maybe if my friends could pass out the, the cards that we'll use as the, as the basis for a drawing. Um, the Ruth Institute promotes lifelong married love to college students and other young adults. And uh, we do that by doing lectures uh, like this one where I go around and give lectures. But we also have other programs where we reach out to people. So one of our most significant and cost-effective programs is the weekly newsletter that we send out to people that has information about every aspect of the marriage issue, whether it be cohabitation, uh, divorce, contraception, um, the same-sex marriage issue, with the life issues, uh, pornography, all of those kinds of things we consider to be all part of the, of the marriage issue. And so we always have uh, uh, articles either by myself or by other members of our circle of experts. So um, if you'd like to receive that, you can give me your email address on this card along with your name. If you just want to be entered into the drawing, just put your name on and don't give me your email address, okay? So it's, it's totally up to you what you want to do. But I do think that if you find this topic tonight of interest, that you will uh, find the newsletter very, very helpful. And by the way, most of the information that we put in there is available for free reprinting. So if you're part of any nonprofit organizations um, or you teach Sunday school or you have any other activity like that where you think some of this information may be helpful to your, uh, to your constituents, most of it is available for you to reprint for free in your stuff. So, um, so that's, part, that's one of our programs. Um, and another one of our programs is that we have a conference uh, where we bring students to San Diego. I'm from San Diego. I'm kind of in shock here with this white stuff in the air. I don't know what this is all about. Um, I, I remember it from Rochester, but anyway, in San Diego, we don't hold with snow. Um, we don't hold with winter. Winter is sort of a, winter is when we get different flowers. You know, the flowers change. The weather doesn't change, but we get different flowers come into season. So anyway, you, if, you like, if you like to visit San Diego at the end of May, um, our conference is open to young adults between the ages of 18 or, and 30, whether you're in school or not. Um, we, it, it's a three-day conference uh, that we put on for, uh, for college students and young adults, so you would be eligible to apply. So what we're going to raffle off today is we're going to raffle off this book called Love and Economics with the subtitle of the title of our talk tonight, It Takes a Family to Raise a Village. So this, the, tonight's lecture will be largely based upon the content of this book, so I'll autograph this for whoever wins. Um, and then we have a booklet called Improve Your Marriage, Even If Your Spouse Doesn't Change a Bit. How's that for a concept, right? It's something you can do to improve your marriage. Um, and then we also have this very cool t-shirt from last year's It Takes a Family conference. You see, It Takes a Family conference. It Takes a Family to Raise a Village, ITAF, we call it, 2012. So this is your sleeping shirt, you guys, OK? So that's, uh, that's part of the prize um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you win the drawing. So uh, if you want to enter in the raffle, just give us your name on the little card. Did you guys have these cards going around already? OK, did everybody get one that wants one? Um, and if you want, would like to be, um, receive the newsletter, be sure you put down your email address as well. So, um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the preliminary business um, that uh, that I have to say. So, um, uh, Father introduced me by telling you about my background and uh, educational background. I have a doctorate in economics. I taught at Yale for five years. Uh, then I taught at uh, George Mason for about 10 years. And sometimes people want to know, well, how did a person in economics end up starting a think tank on marriage and the family and really becoming a full-time advocate for uh, for the ancient teachings on marriage and family, which after all were the, you know, kind of the standard teaching that everybody held up right up until the day before yesterday. It's not like it's uh, a new idea that marriage is somehow central and that uh, children and, and sexuality should somehow be involved in marriage and only in marriage. You know, that, that's, it's not really a new idea. Um, and so how did an economics professor end up doing that? So um, uh, I'll tell you just sort of briefly how that, uh, how that came about. My plan for myself when I was a young professor uh, was that I would um, get tenure at George Mason um, and then I would have a baby 
in the summer. And then I would um, uh, take, take care of the baby during the summer, and I would put the baby in daycare in September and go right back to work. Uh, that was the plan that I had for myself uh, at George Mason. And that's what all of my friends did. That's what I, I had. Uh, I had colleagues at the university, and there were pro the, among them. They had probably had ten children among them, and none of them had ever taken a day off of work. You know, that was that was the ethos that you were supposed to get right back in the saddle and ride. You know, uh, and so that's what I thought I was going to do, and that's I had my whole life built around that idea. Um, and so uh, imagine my surprise when the baby did not arrive during the month that I had set aside for it. Um, and so we were confronted, my husband and I were confronted with a four and a half year infertility crisis, which for me was a whole crisis of faith, which brought me back to the practice of the Catholic faith, which was I, I had been a cradle Catholic and then had left the church um, because I knew better than the church. Um, I, had a, uh, I, I got married at the age of 20 and divorced at 24. The priest who married me at the age of 20 had an inkling that this was not going to end well. Um, and was trying to tell me that, but of course I knew better than he did and I didn't want to hear it, so I marched out of the church never to return again, I'm, I was sure. Um, but then somehow the infertility experience conveyed to me that I was not in control of every single thing that was happening around me, and that it would be a good idea if I, um, you know, turned to God a little bit, let God be involved in my life. So, um, so that, that was a, kind of a part of the story. <clears throat> I don't want to go into that, into that piece of it too much. Suffice to say, though that, um, that it was a kind of turning point. The whole infertility issue was a, was a turning point and a returning point uh, for me to revert um, to the Catholic faith. That's what people call it. You know, you're either a, a cradle Catholic, a convert, or a revert. And I was a revert because I reverted back to the, to the Catholic faith. So, so anyway, <clears throat> we, um, my husband and I, uh, resolved our infertility crisis by deciding that we would adopt. Um, and so in 1990, we uh, were interested in, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just back up a little bit here and say that part of, part of being ready to adopt had to do with letting go. You know, that you can tell by my description of my plan for myself that I pretty much had a death grip, you know, in terms of controlling everything that was happening in my life there, you know. And so I, I had to let go of that a, a little bit. And, um, and I can remember... Um, standing in the, in the grocery store in the, in the aisle where the diapers were and saying to myself, could I live without the diapers? Could I, could I live without all this baby stuff? And it came to me, you know, there in the giant, um, that, uh, that, yeah, it'd be okay if I never had a baby, but I do still want to be a mom. And so in that moment, kind of, it kind of became okay for me to adopt and to not insist that I got a brand new baby, right? So in 1990, we um, put in our paperwork to adopt from a Romanian orphanage. Now, you may remember that, um, that the Berlin Fall Wall went down in 1989. Uh, communism went down in, um, in Romania in 1999. Sorry, um, Kochescu was taken out and shot by his people basically on Christmas Day of 1988, uh, 1989. I keep saying that wrong. Um, and so Eastern Europe was just starting to open up as a place for people to adopt from. And in 1990, we put in our paperwork and, uh, you know, said, well, we're going we're gonna to try. We're going to try. We'll see if we can adopt a child from, from Romania. Um, and in January of 1991, we got a call, a phone call from a social worker, and she said, we have a little boy for you. Um, we know his name and his birth date. He's described as being in good health. Um, he'll be two and a half years old when you get him. What do you say? And we said, sure, why not? We'll take this nice little boy. We, um, you know, when you've been infertile for a long time, you don't really believe a baby's actually going to come, right? So it's like, it was cheap to say that, sure. Um, so we said, sure, right, well, you know, we'll take the baby. Um, and then 10 days later, I went to the doctor with a head cold and found out I was pregnant. So um, we had uh, two children in six months' time, um, which is a record even for a Catholic. I do it that fast. And so it kind of told me that I was back in the faith, you know, but kind of back into the whole Catholic cultural scene there, you know, having kids close together and so forth. But, um, but anyway, so, so we, our, our little boy arrives, and we were really, let us put it gently, we were not prepared. Nothing in my doctoral training in economics remotely prepared me for what we were going to have to deal with. Um, you know, we had the idea that, okay, maybe he'll be delayed or something, and we'll just love him and it'll all be fine, right? Um, and so he arrived in, in, in April of 1991, 
And um, he could not utter a single sound in any language. He did not know his name. He did not respond to the sound of the human voice. In fact, we, we were concerned he might be deaf because he didn't turn when you, when you spoke. Um, and okay, so once we figured out that he wasn't deaf, we uh, didn't realize that this wasn't normal. Our pediatrician had to smack us upside the head basically and say, it's not normal for a two and a half year old to not talk. You need to get him into speech therapy. You know, you need to do something about it. And, uh, and so we did <laughs> and, um, and it came to realize that, yeah, we've got a big project here that we got to do. And so naturally, um, you know, being the sort of hard charging professional that I was, I still, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to get all of my sort of executive skills lined up to get this done, you know, be, and I, I better get it done because I got a little girl coming soon, you know, so let's get this straightened out, you know, and see what we can do. Um, and so we had him to a specialist after specialist and, you know, lots of different kinds of intervention and so on. Um, and then, and then our little girl was born. Um, and when, so here we are with these two children, you know, in our home, uh, me, an economist, completely unprepared, for this situation. My husband, an engineer, I know there are engineers here, but no offense, he was, if possible, even less prepared than I was, right? Um, and so the two of us as nerds basically look at the situation. I'm not hurting anybody's feelings by saying nerd, right? Nerd is a good thing. <laughs> okay, just, just so you know. Okay, for me, nerd is a good thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, well, we look at these two kids and we see a controlled experiment, naturally, <laughs> right? And the controlled experiment is, what difference does it make whether you have a mom and a dad in your life? What difference does it make whether you have a mom and a dad in your life? And of course, the difference was profound. The difference was profound because our little girl was just kind of growing along, going along, developing exactly according to the book, just like it said, we weren't doing anything special or magic, she was just doing it, you know? And we're sitting there with this little guy, you know, working and working and working and saying, wow, a lot, he missed a lot in two and a half years. A lot, there's a lot of stuff that should have happened that didn't happen, and we're now trying to do a catch up and repair job to deal with that. And so, therefore, because of that, uh, we ended up being propelled into this whole area of child development and, uh, and, and, and um, all, all this type of stuff that I was never prepared that I was going to have to do. For a while, I shared this this afternoon when I was doing a talk with, the, with some of the uh, women in the economics and engineering departments. I, I talked with them about, we were talking about unconventional career paths. It was a panel discussion this afternoon. It was, it was very interesting, very helpful. Um, but, uh, but I shared with them at that time that I had the idea that I was still going to somehow keep working. You know, that this is, that somehow I was going to, I don't know, I don't know what I thought. But it was clear very early that I couldn't put this child in daycare. That it would be cruel to put a child like this in daycare because he had already had enough institutional care. You know what I mean? So even a high quality daycare was just not going to cut it. And besides, he couldn't handle it because <laughs> I tried. You know, I wish I could say that I had it all figured out, but I didn't. I tried, and, and, and it didn't work out. So I did the next best thing, which was I hired a nanny. Um, but it became clear that he needed a mommy. He didn't need a nanny. He needed a mommy. That would be me. And nobody but me. I mean, we brought this kid halfway around the world. Um, what, am I going to give him over to somebody else? I mean, what the heck? He needs me to be his mom. But it took us about five years to get to the point where we could see our way clear to me quitting at George Mason finally. And the only reason I quit was because my husband decided that he couldn't take it living in, living in the Beltway anymore. We, you know, George Mason is up in, in Northern Virginia near, near Washington, D.C. And we had moved there for me to take that job at George Mason. And, it, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever lived in Washington, D.C., but trust me, there's no engineering there, right? There's no, it, there's no, re no one builds physical objects in Washington, D.C. There's a lot of social engineering, but that was not his type of engineering. You know, that was just, but he had put up with that for like 10 years. And finally he said, I can't take it anymore. We got to get out of here. <laughs> and so um, he, he had found a job in Silicon Valley working with a laser company. And uh, I said, and he said, we're going. And I, I had then a moment of decision. The moment of decision was, well, am I going to stomp my foot and say, I'm not going unless I get a job at Stanford? 
or am I just going to go? Am I going to just let this thing go? And so it was all grace. I'll tell you, it was all grace. I just let it go and said, okay, I'm going to trust that it's going to be okay. I left a tenured position and went off with my husband to Northern California. And my friends all thought that I had lost my mind. I had friends telling me that I was a countercultural radical. My friend P.J. Hill, I don't know if you know P.J., another economist, hey, Jenny, you, you, you know, you're a radical. You know, you're really out there. I said, okay, well, these kids need me. You see, these kids need me, and they need me right now. They can't wait. You know, they, they, their developmental moment is now. They only get one year to be four. They only get one year to be five. My little boy had lost two and a half years. He didn't need me messing around anymore, you know. So we went, off we went. And, um, and, th and then when I got out there, um, I was there for about, I don't know, a few months, six months, and I went up to the Hoover Institution. He mentioned I was at the Hoover Institution. I went up there, and I, I happened to know the president of the Hoover Institution, John Razian, because he was an economist. He was a labor economist, and he knew who I was. So I said, John, I need a part-time job. I can only work a quarter time. That's all I can manage. And he said, this is the easiest job interview I've ever done. You're hired at a quarter time. I'll give you a quarter, you know, I'll figure out what you're worth and I'll give you a quarter of that and this will be great. And it was great. It was great, right? And so I didn't have to show up at any particular time. I could get my writing done and so on and so forth. And so during that period of time, I wrote two books, okay? Um, and uh, while the kids were at school, you know, I got some books written and that's, that's kind of how I spent that time. But the point is, the point is that that the experience that we had with our little boy was a desperate experience, and nothing but that would have changed me from a perfectly driven uh, career woman to somebody who could step back and say, wait a second, there's something wrong with this whole picture. Let's take a, let's take a more critical look at this whole thing, because what became clear to me, and what I want to share with you tonight in this whole theme of love and economics, is that really and truly it is love that makes the world go around. It really truly is love that makes the world. The economy is built on love. The political system is built on love. And the reason, the way I was able to see that is what our little boy was dealing with was the fact that no one had loved him. It right, was the fact that he had been left alone for two and a half years and he was really not ready to be part of any kind of social life. Right. If he had continued to be left alone, his peers, his confreres who were there in the orphanage, who stayed in the orphanage, they were not going to be fit to be part of any kind of social order. Right? Why? Because they had been so profoundly neglected. So it became clear to me that mothers and fathers are doing a job that is absolutely critical to society that no one else can do. And then if it doesn't get done, you're not going to be able to have a free market economy, and you're not going to be able to have a free society. So that's what I really want to tell you about here, okay, is, it, is how, is what the connection is, how that works, and what this book, Love and Economics, was really all about. And, but I have to start by telling you that without my little boy, I never would have seen it. I never would have thought of it. And of course, I never would have chosen a child with this set of problems. I would have been too scared, right? I would, I would say, I can't handle that. I can't do that. I would have been freaked out, right? So it was, that's why I say it was all a gift. It was all grace, and everything that we went through was a gift from God, everything, every, every aspect of it. I have to also tell you that our little boy is fine now. I don't want, because I don't want you to worry when I start telling you this sort of alarming stuff. He's talking, first of all. He's 24 years old. He talks just fine. <laughs> and, um, and he's living on his own in Fargo, North Dakota, and, and uh, has his own apartment and has a job and so on and so forth. So I don't want you to freak out. <laughs> I have to tell you that at the very beginning. Um, but, but if I had only had our little girl, I would have gotten away with it. You know, in other words, I could have put her in daycare, and she would have come home with a bigger vocabulary. She would have been one of those little children who was just fine in daycare. And I would have gone on my merry way. And I would never have seen all the things that I got to see that were revealed to me uh, by my son and by the experience that we had with him. So let's talk a little bit about this business of what it is the family's actually doing. What are moms and dads actually doing? We want to take a closer look at this badly neglected child, okay? Because it will help us to see. There's a, there's a, um, um, 
Let me start this way. Let's start with a normal child. What is it that normally happens when a baby is born? Okay, when children are born. How, how, how does this work? Well, first of all, when children are born, um, their brains are not fully developed. I think you've probably all heard that. Your brains are not developed until you're 23, and so therefore that's why teenagers are out of their minds. You know, and so there's a whole excuse for why it's all okay. Right? You've all heard that. But, but more profoundly, there's brain development that's going on from the very beginning of life. The fact is if your, head, if your brain was fully developed at birth, you wouldn't make it down the birth canal without killing your mother. Right? So that's a bad plan. That's a structural defect. Okay? So... <laughs> So the, the plan is that the brain develops after birth. Well, there's a part of the brain, a particular part of the brain, that develops in the first 18 months of life. And it's the part of the brain that's called the limbic brain. The limbic brain is the part of the brain that controls your ability to be emotional and to be connected with other people, to be empathetic, to be attached. It's the limbic brain that allows you to look out into the room and sort of tell somebody is freaked out over what I'm saying because I'm looking at your face. Or somebody is about to fall asleep over here and I better tell a joke soon. Or whatever. You know, that allows you to connect with other people and sort of intuit what they're feeling. It's the limbic brain that allows you to experience other people's emotions kind of vicariously. So if you go to a movie and the movie's crowded and everybody cheers at the same moment, it's a different experience than watching it by yourself on your iPhone, right? It's more exciting. It's more fun when you're in that big crowded room with everybody reacting at the same time. Well, if, if your limbic brain doesn't develop properly, none of that happens, right? You don't notice any of it. You don't, you don't connect. You don't, you don't have the ability to interact with one another, with other people in the same way. And where does that brain develop? When does that brain develop? That is the part of the brain that develops right here, right after birth, when your mother is holding you and you're looking at your baby. When you're looking at your baby and rocking your baby, when you're going like this, you're helping your baby's brain develop. The little synapses are starting to connect in that very part of the brain that allows you to be emotional and connected to other people. Because when the baby's born, the baby's looking around. The baby's looking around. And what is he looking for? He's looking for a face. He's looking for a face. Your face, mom. He's looking for mom's face, right? For him to connect to. That's how he's getting organized. That's how his brain is getting organized. That's how he's finding out who he is by interacting and reacting with another person, okay? So if there's, if there's nobody there, if there's nobody there, he's looking and nobody comes, that brain development does not happen. And the other thing that happens is the child starts to turn inward on the self. Okay, they're no longer um, able to able to experience trust as something that is that is a good thing. You know, when a baby starts screaming, they want somebody to come and help them. Okay, and normally somebody comes, right? Somebody comes, you take care of them, you you know you you change them and you feed them and you rock them and you play with them. And if you're a father, you throw them up in the air and you know you do all kinds of stuff with them. But somebody comes, the baby cries, somebody comes, and you don't realize it, but when you come. You are conveying to the child that the world is a safe place that is going to meet your needs and that you can relax into the care of somebody who loves you. You can just kind of, ah, oh, there's mom. And then you get that first smile and you're so in love with that baby. It doesn't matter what the baby looks like. You're in love, right? Moms, you know what I'm talking about? It doesn't matter. Everybody else looks at this baby. It's just a normal baby, lady. What's the matter with you? It's not the most beautiful thing in the world. It's just a normal baby. Oh, it's the most beautiful baby in the world. You know, completely irrational attachment that mothers and babies have for one another. It's a good thing. The irrational attachment's a good thing, right? So if it doesn't happen, the child withdraws into themselves, and they become self-sufficient. They become taking care of themselves. They become rational and calculating, which is completely irrational when you're six months old, right? You're not supposed to be on your own. You're not supposed to be independent when you're in the crib, right? But that's, that's where their little mind, and it's kind of an exaggeration to say it's their mind, but you see what I'm saying? In their little world, that's what gets programmed in, that the world is not safe that they don't really belong here, that they can't trust anybody, and by golly, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen because they take care of it on their own. That's what they end up with. So, what does that do to them? What does that do to them? Well, it means 
that they never really trust anybody. And what can develop is a very serious psychological condition known as attachment disorder. Okay, the very seriously attachment disordered child is somebody who doesn't trust anybody, somebody who doesn't respond to people's, you know, sort of coaxing about what they're supposed to do and not do. It's a child without a conscience. A child without a conscience. I just want you to think about a child without a conscience. A lot of times we talk about conscience development. We're thinking about explaining to children right from wrong. We're going to teach them the Ten Commandments, you know, and why they should follow the Ten Commandments, why you shouldn't steal and stuff, you know. That's kind of what we think about when we talk about conscience development. But the, the truth is that well before you can have this, some kind of conversation about not stealing or not hitting your brother or whatever, there has to be a foundation laid there. And the foundation has to do with, do you give a rat's patoot about whether anybody thinks what people think about you? Right? And if you are properly attached to your mom and then to other people, then you care. Right? If mom's mad at you, you care. And if you're not attached to anybody, you couldn't care less. You couldn't care less. So you can talk to your blue in the face. You can talk to your blue in the face, and they don't care. They don't get it. So you can say, no, don't do that to him because you wouldn't like it if he did that to you. No capacity for reciprocity. See, they don't, they don't care. You can, talk all, you can talk all day long. Normally in conscience development, it goes roughly like this. You're, you, you, you have a child and they're getting into trouble and you pick them up and you get them out of trouble. Right? And then you start telling them, don't do it. And they go, no, don't do it. Mom says, don't do it. Okay, I won't do it. Mom will do some type of cost or benefit to you, to bribe you, to keep you from doing something bad, right? And so you know, okay, mom's going to do this to me. It means mom doesn't like it. Um, and so therefore, I'll stop doing it because of that. But eventually, you, she, mom's across the room. She doesn't have to go over there and get you out of trouble. She doesn't have to smack you. She doesn't have to give you a little package of M&Ms. She just stands over there and gives you this look. And then you go, and you stop whatever it is you're doing. Okay, this is a very important step. It's a very important step in the development of the conscience because it's a, it's a more remote um, uh, penalty, right? It's mom doesn't like it. And then you get to the point where mom's not in the room, but you're thinking to yourself, mom wouldn't like it if she knew, right? And then you get to the point where, uh, who's mom? I don't know. I, 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 I don't care what mom thinks. I'm not the kind of person who even thinks about doing this. I wouldn't even think about doing this because you have made that behavior your own. You've embraced it on your own and you've made it your own behavior and for your own reasons you're just not even thinking about whether you can get away with shoplifting or whether you can get away with stuffing the to 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 uh, towels from the hotel room into your luggage and getting away with it. You're not even thinking about that right? because you're not the kind of person who even thinks about that. But if that conscience development doesn't take place, what happens? Well, you are thinking about it. You can't look across the room and make the, guy make the child behave. When you've got a really seriously attachment disordered child, you've got to keep them very close. You've got to keep them line of sight. We talk about line of sight supervision, where you, you cannot, literally, you cannot let them out of your sight. And you have no idea how taxing it is to make sure that a four-year-old never leaves your sight. Okay? And then when they're a 14-year-old, it's even harder. Okay, I'm just saying. You can't go pick them up and get them out of trouble. But they have no internal compass at all, okay? So they're just going to do what they can get away with. And the truth is, the bigger they get, the more they can get away with. You see what I mean? See what I'm talking about? So a child without a conscience becomes a serious social problem. A very serious social problem. Very expensive to continue monitoring all the time. And you can't do it perfectly. Obviously, you can't do it perfectly, right? So one of the things that will happen, and by the way, I should just say, it's possible some children are born sociopaths. That does happen sometimes. But it's also possible that people are made sociopaths. Okay, Because I mean, that, that's what we're talking about here is the sociopathic personality. So soci some, are, some people are born kind of not put together right, but some people are, it, it's created either by this situation of profound neglect um, or sometimes you'll see it in orphanage, you know, orphanage children like I'm talking about, or sometimes you'll see it in foster children who have been in and out of too many placements and they've never been able to really connect with anybody or attach to anybody. So you'll see this phenomenon of the kids who have no self-command at all, who are doing whatever they can get away with. And, um, and so, uh, uh, therefore, you, you can't really leave them alone. And as they get older, they actually become scary. 
okay? And I've talked to people, I've seen this happen, um, that, 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 that you've got a child who's developing to be 12, 13, 14 years old, and the family is frightened of them. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know how they're going to control them. And sooner or later, the wider society gets involved because they go to jail or they go to juvenile hall, and the parents breathe a sigh of relief that the child is somewhere where they're not going to hurt anybody, hopefully not going to hurt anybody. And so when you're looking at something like that, it now becomes clear just what it is that moms and dads do during the normal course of development. They're, they're cutting that off, right? They're keeping that from happening, right? They're making it possible for a person to grow up and become a person who can use freedom without bothering other people too much. You see, in economics, we assume that people are going to make contracts and uh, keep their promises and uh, follow the rules, give value for value um, in, in, their, in their transactions. They're not going to take advantage of every possible opportunity they have to benefit themselves, right? They're going to basically play by the rules. But in economics, we never asked ourselves the question, where do adults come from? Right. Where do adults come? Or we, you know, I'm pretty sure that two-year-olds do not respect property rights. You know, I, it just doesn't happen that way. So, you somehow have to get a child from infancy, from this condition of helpless, um, uh, self-centeredness in infancy, up through the point where they can be turned loose in society without bothering other people too much. Okay, and so that's what moms and dads are doing. That's what moms and dads are doing. And think about me and my sort of um, condition of thinking, well, I was, I'm just going to put my kid in daycare and it's all going to be good. It'll be high quality, low cost daycare. It'll be efficient. It'll be great. And, uh, and I'll be able to get right back on the career track. It became real to me that what I was doing in my home was more significant socially than anything I was doing in the classroom at George Mason. And that m thousands of women were undervaluing their work as mothers. Thousands of women are, were afraid to say, this is my most important vocation. And it's important precisely because no one can do it but me. For this child, there's no one else but me. And if you think of it that way, then you go, well, wow, I'm really important. You know, I'm, irre I'm literally irreplaceable to this child. George Mason can get another person to teach economic history and, and microeconomics. It'll be just, the university will go on just fine without me there to do that. But for these two kids, it's got to be me. It's got to be me. And why should we be ashamed of that? Why should we be embarrassed about that? You see what I mean? So I came to see that the whole society was overlooking and undervaluing the very significant and important things that mothers do. And that therefore the fathers do. That the father in the background is offering something extremely important to the mother. Because while mom and, mom and baby are sitting here going like this, right? Mom and baby are sitting here going like this. Who's taking care of the mom, right? Mom's taking care of baby. Somebody's got to take care of mom, right? Because if she's out there working all the time, she can't be here as much as she would like to be and as much as she needs to be. You've got to have some backup. There's got to be some backup to this, uh, to, this, to this bonding relationship. And then, of course, as the child grows older, more things change and become more significant. The father's role becomes more significant as the child is older and so on. And so um, in the course of... Uh, the, the whole point of love and economics was to explain the connection between motherhood and what goes on inside the family and the larger picture of the free society. That if you don't have moms and dads taking care of their kids and taking care of them in a personal way, you really can't come up with a very good substitute for that. And so in the book, I go through some of the possible substitutes. Well, uh, what, what about daycare? Could you put your kid in daycare and have it all turn out the same way? Well, there's a bunch of research that's been done on daycare, and this is one of these topics that uh, for a period of time was studied a lot, and then people kind of quit studying it uh, because they didn't like the answer they got. You know, they were coming up with the answer that some kids don't do well in daycare. And there was a big debate about whether uh, whether, whether you could compensate for that by having daycare that was, was high enough quality, you could have non-maternal care that was high quality non-maternal care, um, and, and did it matter, and um, you know, what, was it true for all kids or just some kids, and is it significant enough that mothers shouldn't worry? But the overriding consideration was, we don't want working mothers to feel bad. Well, as a working mother, wouldn't you rather know the truth? 
And the reality is that every mother can tell whether her child is doing okay. And that, in a way, is the most significant thing. Now, because in some of those results, uh, there, there was an elevated risk of attachment disorder, of attachment difficulties. And I don't want to say full-on sociopathic attachment disorder, but, it, but weakened attachments. It was an elevated risk of too much daycare. And I'll just leave it at that because it's all, all highly specified. You know, they studied it very carefully as to how many hours per week and so on and so forth. But, uh, but too much daycare can lead to a weakened detachment by the age of four. It wouldn't show up when you're two, but it starts to show up when you're four, right? And so the problems then tend to accumulate over time, right? Um, and, um, and particularly in boys. So little girls tend not to be as sensitive to the daycare experience, but little boys tended to be more apt to get uh, attachment disorders or to have other kinds of aggressive behavior and other kinds of problems in daycare. Well, so you start to think about these results and you go, well, wait a second. Wait a second, if you're a mom and you're a family and you're sitting there looking at your own family, the only thing you need to know about this situation is, how is your kid doing? How is your kid doing? And do you have it in your, is it possible for you to get your kid out of there if they're not doing well? And so when I first wrote this book, I did a lot of talk radio and you know, stuff promoting the book, um, did lectures and so on. And people would often call up and, and, and want to know, is it okay to put my kid in daycare? Or how dare you say there's anything bad about daycare? And, you know, and finally, finally I, 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 it just became real to me that there's really only one thing you need to know as a young woman planning your life. There's only one thing you need to know about daycare. The one thing you need to know is not all children do well in daycare. That's all you need to know. So maybe every child you have will do well in daycare all the time. Maybe that'll, be the tr maybe that'll turn out to be true. But you can't plan your life on that, right? You may need to take your kid out. You know, it may not work for you. And in that case, if you have put yourself in a situation where your income is absolutely crucial to the family, then you got a problem. Then you got a problem, right? So that, that's the way I would answer that question is don't put yourself in a jam if you can possibly help it, don't put yourself in such a jam that you absolutely have to have two full-time incomes or your own full-time income in order to um, manage the household. Buy a smaller house or do whatever, you know, but, but don't make a plan that requires um, your full-time work because it might not work out, right? And you don't want to be in a situation where you're going to compromise the well-being of your child because of your mortgage. You know, you don't want to plan uh, in that way. And if you think about it ahead of time, you can probably make a plan such that that won't be the case. So, so that's, that's kind of my shtick on daycare. But the thing that I want to say about it is that a lot of people did make a plan. Certainly when I was, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, people were making a plan as if their child would always be in daycare. And that was a big um, misleading thing for us to be doing. That was a, it was it was more um, it wasn't reasonable. That wasn't a reasonable set of expectations, is what I want to say. So um, so daycare can't take care of your kids. That's like saying the market is going to solve the problem. That, that would be that was sort of my the market. Let's let the market solve this problem. No, the market cannot solve the problem of raising your child for you, right? Don't put them in daycare. That's not the, the you need a real person, You're not, a, not a commercial transaction. It's not the same thing. So um, th th then you ask, well, can the government, is there something the government can do about it? And the answer is, well, no, really, the government can't make up for all of the things that are lacking if the personal relationship between the mother and the child or the father and, or, the, or, the, or the parental relationship, if that's somehow been damaged, um, there's nothing the government's going to do after the fact that's going to repair that, right? There's, and, and we kind of knew that because a lot of what we were doing, we, we had to take advantage of many different government programs to try to help our little boy, right? And you're investing uh, a lot of resources um, to try to make up for this profound neglect that he had experienced. And so w we could just see that there aren't enough programs. There just aren't enough programs to undo what had been done. You see what I mean? And yet you feel you have to do it, right? But the better plan is to just let's not go there in the first place. You know, let's not allow children to experience this kind of profound neglect in the first instance. Let's create a society where moms and dads are taking care of their kids and taking personal care of their kids. And then, of course, the whole question 
uh, that, that really interested me is that I had it in my mind um, that people could do whatever they wanted in their family lives and it would somehow all work out in the end. I had this kind of laissez-faire idea that, it, that are so popular among economists, right? Um, uh, that if, we, if, we, if, if everybody just does what they want, somehow it will all work out in the end. And so I spent a lot of this book trying to explain that that doesn't really apply to the family, right? That grown-ups can make perfect plans that work great for them but really may not work out for the kid. Um, and, uh, and so the stability of the union between the mother and the father is extremely important to the child, and uh, qu quite apart from whether mom and dad are happy. Kids don't really know whether mom and dad are happy. They don't really care that much if mom and dad are happy. As long as it's not disrupting their life, the kids don't really care, okay? So in doing the research for this book, I looked into uh, the impact of unmarried parenthood. I looked into the impact of divorced parenthood. And what happens when kids' parents get divorced? What are the outcomes for children? And of course, what you find is that all of these things are traumatic for children and problematic for children. And I'll just give one example of a kind of result that, uh, that, is, that is out there in the sociological literature. By the way, this stuff has been studied a lot. These are not fluky results. There are a lot of studies of family structure. That's what it's called, family structure. A lot of these studies have been done. And I'll just tell you one, of the, one, uh, one very well-designed study done by Paul Amato at the University of Pennsylvania. He asked the question, is divorce, he was trying to ask, is divorce a bad thing for kids? Is divorce harmful for children? And uh, you know, there was a result out there that, yeah, that, yeah it seems to be pretty traumatic. Um, but, but isn't it better for the child if the parents are really fighting? If there's a lot of violence, if there's a lot of conflict, wouldn't it be better for the kids if the parents split up? And so he looked into that, and he created a, a two classes, high-conflict marriage and low-conflict marriage. Okay, and, he, and then he did a, a, a kind of a test. If you're in a high-conflict marriage and your parents get divorced, or a high-conflict marriage and your parents stay married. Low-conflict marriage, your kid, parents stay divorced, get divorced, or they stay married, okay? So you've got like four categories here, okay? You can see how this works. So what he found is that if, you, if you're in a high-conflict household, which means domestic violence, drug abuse, uh, high-level quarreling, a lot of quarreling, um, a lot of, lot of noise, you know, um, indeed the children are better off if their parents get divorced. They are better off if all that goes away, if all that calms down, right? And they go someplace else, of course, it'd be better if the parents didn't act like that. Of course, that would be first best. But given that that's what's going on, the kids do benefit from that all going away, right? But in a low-conflict marriage, in a low-conflict marriage where mom and dad are unhappy and discontent and maybe they got problems in the bedroom, in those cases, the children are worse off if their parents divorce. And why is that? Because the children, by and large, aren't really aware of how bad it might be or how uncomfortable it might be for mom and dad. They don't know what's going on. Kids are self-centered, right? What they know is that their lives are going to be changed forever, and, um, and they don't know why. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense to them. And so it's in that situation where you have a low-conflict marriage that ends in divorce, that is the kind of divorce that's extremely painful for children, it's extremely traumatic, and there are, again, a whole lot of results um, that, have, that have been discovered, down to and including the fact that children of divorce have difficulty of their own forming their own attachments and forming their own marriages and, and, and trusting other people, because that primary attachment has been, has been disrupted for them. So, um, so the, the, the significance of this is that Society really does have a, have a genuine interest in the stability of married life. That the idea that we just get to do whatever we want and kind of make it up as we go along is really a disservice to us. Because when you start off your married life, of course you don't know what's going on, right? You start off in life, you, you, you don't know how it's going to work. And if you're going to do it all by trial and error, I mean, like, how many divorces do you want to go through to figure it out, right? I mean, you can really chew up a lot of time, break your heart, do a lot of harm to other people. It would be, be helpful to know going in what's a good thing to do and not do. And so this is part of the cost, I want to say, that this is part of the cost of what we have called the sexual revolution that appears to be about creating greater freedom for people, but in fact has um, made us less free 
in a whole number of dimensions. And this is what I want to take a couple of minutes to just spell out the connection between the, the dysfunction in the family and the breakdown of the family and the loss of freedom, of what would be understood as freedom. First of all, the kind of unhappiness and trauma that we're talking about, are thing, these are things that affect people psychologically and their ability to have a happy life. So let's just start with that, right? That if you're walking around with a kind of uh, of a psychological burden uh, that, that people often do walk away from these situations with, that th you're not really, f it's, it's a mistake to call it free. You see what I mean? Because there's a, there's, a, there's a tax there, there's a big cost there. Secondly, to take the most um, sort of materialistic, crude way of looking at it, it's expensive to bust up the family and reconstitute the family. It's very expensive to do that. It's expensive to the individuals. It's expensive to the taxpayers. From the individual point of view, let's just think about it. You are there. Um, you've got a household. You've got, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about divorce now. Um, uh, you've got a household. You've got two adults and some kids living, living together in one household. Now you break it apart. You've got the same amount of income. You're trying to support two households. That doesn't usually enhance people's standard of living. You know, usually that's, that's a problem, okay? Then if you have any uh, spillover effects or, or uh, fallout, kind of emotional or psychological fallout, poor school performance, in, in increased probability of using drugs, increased probability of uh, dropping out of school, uh, increased probability of psychological disorder, all of those things end up costing the taxpayer money. Okay, it ends up costing the taxpayer money. In 2008, there was a study done of the taxpayer cost of out of wedlock and unmarried parenthood is what, is what it was. And somebody was looking at the taxpayer cost. You just add up all of these different things that I'm talking about here. Increased cost to the criminal justice system and poverty reduction and all these different things. And what they came up with was an co annual cost to the taxpayers, federal, state, local, $112 billion per year, $112 billion per year, that's billion with a B, spent on dealing with the cost of non-marital childbearing in one form or another. Just to put that in perspective, $112 billion is the equivalent of the GDP of New Zealand at that time. So we were spending the GDP of New Zealand just to kind of clean up after uh, the, the problems that we've created by non-marital or, merit or disrupted marriage uh, 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 going on. And then finally, I want to point out that if you, have, if you do get to the point where the, where the dysfunction includes attachment disorder, if you've got attachment disorder going on, um, and you're, you're kind of creating little sociopaths, society cannot function with very many people who don't have a conscience. This is what I want to point out. Every society has some bad actors. There's no getting around that. You know, you're going to have to have criminal justice system. You're going to have to have some way of dealing with people who either don't control themselves or don't have a conscience or whatever. But if you are um, creating a situation where you're systematically more likely to be having young kids without a conscience, you simply can't absorb very many people without a conscience without having to really increase the amount of protection that you have to create in society. You have to increase the, the, um, the things that have to do with crime control and criminal justice and all of those types of things. In other words, put it this way, if you can't control yourself, somebody has to control you. If you don't have a cop inside your head telling you to do and not do, telling you to not take advantage of other people and not steal when you can get away with it and all those things, if you don't have a cop inside your head or inside your heart, you're going to have to have a lot more cops on the corner. See? And so in all of those ways, the family is an essential part of creating and maintaining a free society. And so when I say that the, the economy depends on love, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. Without a good first year, without a good start in life, right, you're going to have a lot more people that you're going to have to deal with that are going to be really expensive. Right? And, um, and you, you can put it this way, too. You can think about when you're in business with people and you make a contract with them, can you write down every single thing you expect somebody to do in a contractual forum? Just think about this a minute. I don't know, if any, I don't know what disciplines you guys are in, but in law, 
or in economics sometimes they'll say, you can't fully specify a contract. You can't write down every single thing you expect the person to do. There's an element of goodwill that's required to keep the thing going because you don't want an army of lawyers litigating every single detail of what you're going to do and not do, right? If you do that, it's like crazy. You can't get it done, right? Um, and so if you don't have a conscience, you got to start writing it all down. You see what I mean? So in all of those ways, what the family is doing is extremely important and constructive to society. And the idea that there are no limits on what people can do in their family, the idea that adults get to do whatever they want and somehow it's going to work, um, that, is a, that is an idea we need to surrender. That's an idea that we need to let go of. That there actually is more freedom in the commitment of mother and father to one another and to their children. That that commitment actually creates a zone of freedom where you can work together and you can collaborate and you're creating your own little constructive society that's contributing rather than contributing to the sort of overall uh, breakdown of society. And that it's, it's a mistake to say that we get to do whatever we want and it somehow will all work out in the end. There are constraints that are necessary, that are constructive, and that actually make us happy as individuals as well as making us happier and, uh, and more prosperous as a society. So I think I'll stop there um, and, uh, and start taking questions. I have no idea what time it is. There's no clock in this room. Um, and so we'll just take questions as long as people um, you know, have issues that they'd like to talk about. So thank you very much. And if I could get, if I could get one of the student um, helpers to go around and collect the, um, collect the cards, anybody who wants to be part of the raffle drawing or, or anyone who'd like to receive the Ruth Institute newsletter um, can just go ahead and, um, and, and put it in there. Okay, so let's see who has questions. Okay, no students. No stu let's, let's, I would, I'd like to take a student question first. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Well, I'm asking two questions. So the first one is, you always mentioned the role of the mom. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's it's certainly possible for the father to be the primary caregiver in the child in the child's early years. That is certainly possible, and sometimes that's what happens. Um, and and I'm um, I, I'm the type of person. A lot of times people will ask me this. Sometimes people come up to me and sort of quietly ask me, Doctor Morris, is it okay if we do this? And usually, if if mom and dad are working together in a stable way and they have a plan that works for them, it's probably going to be okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's what I would say. But but I would also say that um, that do not be surprised if mom strongly prefers it, and if baby strongly prefers mom, don't be surprised and don't get your feelings hurt. <laughs> um, you know, because sometimes that we're not quite ready for that. A lot of times, that the strength of the attachment. Um, it, it takes people by surprise. So that, that, that'd be the only thing I'd say about that. I, I, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's the second question. That was the second? Oh, no, that was the first one. Okay. You got a second question? Go ahead. So, um, <laughs> you definitely talked about it out of wedlock and unmarried. Uh-huh. Parents with all the costs and all the problems that uh -huh. Um, that question is not a proper question in a way because, the, in, in, a, in other words, if a child, uh, if you have a single mom, okay, um, the, the question isn't, is, is, she, is that child going to be with that single mom or is that child going to go to a gay couple? The child's going to stay with her mom, right? And so the, the question isn't, um, what, what are we going to do about that child, okay? It would be better if, that, if, the, if the mom and the dad could work together and take care of their child together. That would be the best thing. So, so uh, to put the question, the put, I, I'm not sure what you're asking in this question. Yeah, it's cause, yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> I mean, what, what do you think, I mean, what is worse for a child at all? Like, you Um, 
again, that question doesn't have a well-defined answer in the sense that um, what are we talking about? Taking that child from one situation to the other? Are we talking about taking that child? That, are we talking about that child's mother having a relationship with another woman or that child having a relationship with the child's father? Or are we talking about, are we going to place a child for adoption and we're trying to figure out what kind of adoptive home we're going to put them in? No, no, I'm saying they have two kids. Okay. Mm-hmm. One is raised by a single mother and mm -hmm. one is raised by a couple of Okay. 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 There have been, there have been, uh, a number of studies that, per, that uh, have tried to look at some of those questions. There have been about 55 studies that purport to say that there's no difference between a child being raised by a gay couple and being raised by anybody else. When you look closely at those studies, what you will see is serious methodological difficulties with those studies, okay? And in particular, most of them have very small sample sizes, uh, none of them have representative samples, so usually they're drawn from a sample of people who volunteered to be part of the study. Okay, so you didn't just go take a random gay person and a random straight person and compare them. Most of the studies, as a matter of fact, don't even have control groups. Okay, if you look at this whole list of studies, um, so the, uh, every one of those studies has serious methodological flaws to it. So you can say, uh, in fact, one of them, what, there's at least one study that I know of, was done by Charlotte Patterson, who is a sociologist, um, and she literally, she says at the beginning of the study, uh, she, she wanted to study the impact, she wanted to look at how children were doing if they were raised by lesbian parents, and so she called her friends to invite them to participate in the study. Okay, so Charlotte Patterson and her friends they, their children are doing fine, but you can't generalize from that, okay? So those are the, when you hear this in the news that they're all, they're all doing fine, they're all, they're, every one of these studies has some kind of serious flaw like that. Now, so that, that, this past summer, a study was released that was a representative sample study, okay? And that study, which answers the question that you, actually does attempt to answer the question that you're asking about, that study went and, and took a literally random sample of people and asked, uh, what is the family, and, and this actually important thing, number of important things about it, because I'm going to get to your answer. Now that I know what you want to know, I'm going to answer your question. Um, so I have to explain the design of this study. It was a study of uh, young adults, age 18 through 30, where they were asked questions about what was your family like growing up, family structure growing up, what was it like for you then, what is your life like now? Whole series, about 40 questions that were, they were asked, and they were sorted by family structure, okay? And the family structure, the way they did it, they went out and they hired a polling company who went out and, you know, uh, they surveyed several thousand people, so they ended up with a sample of over a thousand people, so it was truly representative. And they had a sample of continuously married parents, kids whose parents were continuously married, those who were single, always single, those who were divorced and divorced and remarried, kids who were adopted, kids whose mother ever had a relationship with a person of the same sex, kids whose father ever had a relationship with a, a, a person of the same sex. Okay, so they, they literally studied all of those things. And I have to tell you, if you look down at the self-reports by the young adults, what it was like for them, out of those 40 measures, out of 27 of those measures, were statistically significant that the children that had, whose moms had a lesbian relationship were worse off, reported worse results in at least 27 different measures, okay? And that's compared with kids, they were worse off than kids with single moms, okay, in some, in some of the dimensions. Now there's a, you know, there's a bunch of different ones, and some of those different pairwise comparisons are, you know, they're not, they're not all the same. But it's plain that there's significant difficulties in those type of households, some of which, and, and it's, it's, the, the, I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention one because this is a result that got a lot of attention. Um, if you ask the question, um, uh, uh, are, you, are you exclusively heterosexual? They, that was one of the questions that they asked these 18 to 30 year olds. So it's the, it's the adults themselves telling about themselves. Are you exclu exclusively heterosexual? Um, what turned out to be true is that kids whose parents were continuously married were the ones most likely to say, yeah, I'm exclusively heterosexual. The kids whose parents had had a um, same-sex relationship were the most likely to say that they were not, 
and in between were those whose parents who had a missing parent at some point in their in their in their life okay so the, if your parents were divorced you were you were you did have an elevated chance of saying i'm not exclusively heterosexual now what's interesting about that is that there's something about that other parent there's something about the two parents being present that's significant for the development of gender identity right now we don't know exactly what that is but we know that family structure is a significant variable in that. So um, there's, there's a lot of information in that study. A one well-designed study can tell you an awful lot. And, uh, and that's, that's a study that you know, got a, a lot of attention, but I think it will stand the test of time because it was very well-designed. Okay? Yes? <laughs> okay, the author is Mark Regneris, spelled R-E-G-N-E-R-U-S, Mark Regneris, out of uh, the University of Texas at Austin. And I forget the exact title of the study. If you, if you Google it, you'll find the study and you'll find a lot of people saying mean things about him. Um, but, but, if you but you should read the study yourself. Okay, you should read the study yourself, paying particular attention to the tables, um, and, uh, and, and you'll, see, you'll see what I mean. At the same, the same issue of that um, journal, Social Science, I forget, the, I forget right now even the name of the journal, because it's an online journal, and I have it in my filing cabinet at home. In that same issue, there was another article that critically reviewed all of these uh, previously done studies. And that author, go, that author is named Lauren Marks, um, uh, Marks like M-A-R-K-S. And his first name is, it's a man, Lauren, L-O-R-E-N, OK? And he reviews all of the studies that have been done up to that time that the American Psychological Association used in its brief to say that there's no difference between the children of same-sex parents and others. And he basically uh, shows that the studies that were used all had s at least one and sometimes several serious methodological flaws. So th those, those are very, in, in its way, that study is the most devastating, you know, because it shows that these things that get a lot of headlines, the headlines are really quite misleading. If you look at it a little more closely, there's less there than meets the eye. Um, and so that's, that's also worth, worth, worth your while to look at. Okay? Yes? <laughs> When you say when you say we don't have paid maternal leave, I think a lot of people do have paid maternal leave. You mean as a federal policy or something done by the government, or it must be as a federal because a lot of people do, in fact, have paid maternal leave. It must be as a federal yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 You know, um, paid maternal leave is a very, that's a very interesting issue and question because the problem is to, uh, is, is what are you going to do right at the time that the baby's born? Um, and then the question is, is, is your goal to have mom staying out of the labor force full time for a long period of time or is your goal for her to go back to work? And I think American feminists have had as their goal for women to get right back into the labor force. You know, that has been for a long time the main thrust, that we don't want women to get, fall behind in their career development because in many, in many careers, um, you know, leaving the labor force is very costly just in terms of your advancement and your development of human capital and your knowledge and all that kind of stuff. And so there's been a lot of emphasis on getting people back in. So for my money, for my, my way of thinking about it, is that what women really need the most is the most flexible kinds of arrangements that are consistent with some kind of economic sense, right? So um, if, you're, if your flexibility is not economically viable, it, you know, it, then, then, then you probably need to rethink it somehow. And I think most people, I, I think there isn't one right answer for families too. You know, that's the other thing that's important, that a lot of times the national policies or the nationalized policies create a new norm and that's what everybody does, and it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So, so I would be, I, I'm a little bit reluctant to say that, yeah, we should have a federally mandated 
X, X amount, amount of um, weeks or months or whatever for, for maternity leave. Because what tends to happen is um, a, pol a company will have a policy, there's this many weeks, or a university will have, there's this many weeks, and then that becomes the default. That's it. That's what everybody takes. And if you don't take that, you're gone, you know. Um, and so I, I think it, it'd be the, the, the more flexibility that you can have, the, the better it would be. Um, but I think, I think the, the larger point that I want to make here um, is, that, is that women themselves have kind of bought into the position that our objective is to be as much like men as possible. And that, that doesn't really work for us. That they, and and I, don't think, I don't think that should be our objective. Our sh objective should be to create something that allows us to work together as a family and collaborate for the benefit of the whole family. So, you know, um, women live longer than men. Um, we should, we, maybe we could be taken five years, ten years out of the labor force in the middle of our lives and working longer. You know, let our husbands relax a little bit, you know, or, or, uh, or something like that. Um, there, there are inequities built into the, um, to the social security system, too. If you look at the social security system, you get, you get um, more money if you work, but you don't get more money if you produce a taxpayer, a future taxpayer. Right, if you stay home and you raise kids, you're you're producing the taxpayers. Well, the reason Social Security is bankrupt is is not a fiscal problem; it's a it's a fertility problem, right? You know, if we had the same fertility rate today that we had in 1935, Social Security would not be in the in the state that it's in. But but the system doesn't reward fertility; it just re, it only rewards financial contribution. It doesn't reward the other kind of contribution. But they're both but they're both obviously important to it. Peter, did you want to ask something or say something? <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I think you're sort of talking about the same problem. Yeah. Is that kids start school and they're behaviorally disadvantaged. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the baby college program in, in New York City, but efforts to try to train mothers how to interact with their children when they themselves were yeah. raised. Yeah, yeah. I'm not familiar with Baby College. I'm I'm familiar with some earlier efforts that were like that. There were some there were some uh, programs that that had that were early intervention type of programs that involved preschool, but also had a large component of working with the moms. And so I'm just not familiar with the with the current one. But the, it it does seem that the intervention with the moms is a very significant component of the thing so to help them to be more appropriate moms and um, and you know to to just know what to do. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I think I think Heckman's stuff on the non-cognitive uh, problems is is very significant because a lot of these kids come to school and they can't sit still, um, or they, you know they have all kinds of behavioral problems which then spill over to the other kids in the classroom as well as making it impossible for them to learn. So, but the um, but but yeah, we've got a 40 percent out of wedlock childbearing situation now. It's now up to 40 percent, and in lower income communities, it's even higher. It's about 70 percent, right? And so part of that is a result of some of the rules that have been in place for years on welfare payments, right? And so, so the, the disincentive to marry is something that has got to be addressed. People have known that for a long time that that needs to be addressed, and, and, and we haven't been, you know, really dealing with that. So um, having, um, having an intact family uh, w would be a good thing. But the problem is now a lot of the men in the community are not marriage material. Um, for a whole variety of reasons that's happened. So I look at it this way. I, I, I'm going to change the subject slightly, Peter, because I don't have anything to add to this, but I think it's germane to what you're saying. You know, a lot of people, um, it's, it's so, so I get into trouble sometimes because I have a lot of fiscal conservative friends, right? And I can't get them interested in the family. Love and economics was really a love letter to my fellow economists. I was trying to get them to take the family seriously, and I couldn't get them to get it. So look at it this way. A $15 trillion debt, or whatever it is, you know, this is a huge burden to future generations. But a 40% out of wedlock childbearing rate is the social equivalent of the $15 trillion debt. We're extracting resources from the young, or we're withholding resources from the young that are properly theirs. You know, they, we have no right to withhold their future stream of income to pay for our stuff, and we have no right to withhold our love 
from them and to withhold our self-sacrifice on their on their behalf. We have no right to do that to them. And so that's uh, I think of it as the as the fiscal the, the social equivalent of that of that fiscal of that fiscal crisis and hopefully somebody will get maybe that'll get through to some of their heads I don't know. Do you need me to uh, All right, we we'll, we'll 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 choose a name. We'll choose a name here. Why don't you choose, Father? You pick somebody. Th then you'll know this is an honest raffle here. <laughs> to have the Padre pick a name here. <laughs> He's not taking just the top one here. Yeah. <laughs> it says here, Bethany Dahlke, D-A-H-L-K. All right, there you go. We'll get you the prizes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I guess we're, does that mean we're going to stop, Father? No, no. Oh. Oh, now people can leave. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. But if everybody has more questions, there are three best days for the questions. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.